Hey guys, Miss Marisic here, and in this video we're going to be talking about the different forms of light on the electromagnetic spectrum, and we're also going to talk about spectroscopy, which is how matter responds when it's exposed to light. So to start us off here, hopefully this electromagnetic spectrum chart looks familiar. Uh, we did look at it back in pre-AP chemistry. This shows us all of our different types of light, both visible and non-visible. Our visible light range is that Roy G. Biv color spectrum that falls in the 700 to 400 nanometer wavelength range. Um, however, our other forms of light here are non-visible forms. We can't pick those up with our human eyes. They're, our retinas are not capable of sensing those particular wavelengths. Um, however, it's really helpful to kind of remember the order that the spectrum would have, and you'll see why here in just a little bit. Um, so I usually remember that red Martians invade Roy G. Biv using x-ray guns. I know it sounds really silly. It's a kind of a funny way to remember it, but it's just a way to remember that order so you can remember which end of the spectrum is our high energy end and which end of the spectrum is our low energy end. So with that said, let's talk about our different ends of the spectrum here for just a moment. Uh, you notice it does give us some wavelength ranges here for our different waves. Um, you notice radio waves has a really big wavelength value. So I'm going to draw a wave over here with a big wavelength, whereas on this gamma rays end, we see a very small wavelength. And now I'm not even doing this justice here as far as the size difference, but at least give us kind of a starting place to compare these. OK, so let's talk about putting a wavelength relationship down on this end of the spectrum. We are going to have a wavelength value that's really high. However, on this end, we're going to have a wavelength value that's really low. Okay, so next let's talk about frequency. Frequency is how many wave cycles are passing per second. Now, all of these are forms of light, so they're all going to be moving at the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So if these two waves are moving at the same speed, think about which one is going to have more wave cycles, more crests, pass per second. Hopefully we realize that this one would have a lot more wave cycles that would pass. So what that means is that this end of the spectrum will have a frequency value that's really high, whereas on this end we're going to have a frequency value that's really low. So you notice that wavelength and frequency are inverse of each other. So now let's talk about energy. I would hope that we remember that this end of the spectrum is kind of bad for us. Like think about when you go to the dentist and you wear that big lead apron to protect you from the x-rays, or we wear sunscreen to protect us from ultraviolet radiation. A gamma rays gets released when we're talking about nuclear decay, so obviously that's really bad. And if that end is bad for us, then that means that has really high energy that can end up penetrating our body and affecting our biological structures, our DNA structures. Um, which makes sense when you look at this wave. If you think about moving along that wave, it looks like we would have lots of energy to it, right? But this is kind of a nice, gentle, calm wave. And so on this end, we're going to have energy values that are really low. Low. So you notice that frequency and energy are directly related, but again, wavelength and energy are inversely related. Now where that's going to be helpful is if I'm trying to compare two forms of light and I'm trying to ask myself which one would have the higher frequency or the lower energy or whatever the case may be, if I kind of remember a little bit about the order of that scale, I can then answer those questions. All right, let's go ahead and look at the next page, which talks about the different things that light can do in the atom. So as I said a few minutes ago, spectroscopy is the study of how matter interacts with electromagnetic radiation, that visible and non-visible forms of light that we saw on our electromagnetic spectrum. It says here that different forms of light can cause different changes in atoms and subatomic particles depending on how much energy that light source has. So let's start off with the first type here that it mentions, which is microwave radiation. Microwave radiation causes changes in molecular rotations. And a nice way of remembering that is the fact that a microwave plate 
rotates inside of the microwave. And so that's, again, a helpful way of just remembering that microwave radiations do those rotations. And so what that means is that basically it would cause molecules to twirl around at a particular axis, okay? Um, our next type of radiation here is infrared radiation. You notice that that has an increase in energy if you're thinking about our electromagnetic spectrum. So here having an increase in energy, I'm going to see a little more effect being caused by this particular type of radiation. Here, infrared radiation causes vibrations in the bonds. So whereas the first one we just had molecular rotations, now we're actually starting to impact stuff that's inside of the molecule. We're starting to cause stretching and bending of those bonds. So a little more impact on our molecules. So now let's up the ante on the energy even more. Let's jump up to visible or ultraviolet radiation. And when I up that energy, now I'm going to start affecting what's going on inside of those atoms. So this causes changes in electron energy levels. Hopefully we remember back from pre-AP the terms excitation and relaxation. Excitation is when those electrons gain energy and jump up energy levels and they can't stay excited forever so eventually they fall back down and release light but that gain of energy that they take in to cause the excitation is due to the intake of visible or ultraviolet radiation, that amount of energy. Now the more energy I gain, the higher jump I would have, which means the greater fall I would have. So when that excitation happens, when I intake that energy and I jump up, it can't stay excited forever, so eventually it falls. And the bigger the fall that I have, the more energy I would end up releasing. So you notice here, um, this is the emission spectrum for specifically hydrogen. In hydrogen, you can have a fall from level six down to level two that releases a violet light. That was a really big fall that occurred. Um, however, you notice a shorter fall from three to two would only release red light, which is a lower energy light. It has a longer wavelength, but it's a lower energy of light. Now, every single atom has its own kind of almost like a fingerprint, its own identification of its emission spectrum. Only certain falls are visible in each atom. For example, here in hydrogen, the only falls that are visible are actually down to level two. It would then have to continue to fall down to level one, but those falls aren't visible. But in every single atom, those falls that are visible are a little bit different. So for every single atom, they're going to have their own emission spectrum that identifies that particular element. Um, and so we can use that to figure out what kind of elements are present in different places. Like, for example, one of the ways that they figured out that hydrogen is present in stars is that they performed uh, an analysis of the light being released from stars. They ran it through a spectroscopy to see that the types of light that was being released tied to the emission spectrum of hydrogen. Now, um, some other places we can see colors being released because of excitation or relaxation are, as we said, flame tests of fireworks and auroras, northern lights. And the northern lights are created by gases in our atmosphere doing that excitation relaxation process. Now for us what we're concerned with is the fact that I can use all of this to conduct what's called a UV VIS spectroscopy which is something that we're going to do next class when we talk about the Beer-Lambert law. I can actually analyze visible colors of different solutions um, to figure out their absorption and emission and then I can translate those values into what kind of concentration they have. So we're going to talk a lot about about UV VIS spectroscopy next class. All right, let's say I up the energy even more and I get all the way to X-ray radiation. Um, X-ray radiation is associated with causing changes in electron structure. So now all of a sudden, we're not feeding enough energy in it just to get it excited. Now it's going to have so much energy that it's actually going to totally leave the atom and conduct what's called an ionization. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because we've actually talked about this type of spectroscopy earlier on in the year. This is what is used in photoelectron spectroscopy 
or PES. If you remember these lovely graphs right here, uh, what these peaks showed is how much energy it takes to eject electrons out of our different sublevels. And so when we were measuring these energy amounts, we were measuring the amount of energy it takes to get electrons to leave. So this was tied to that X-ray radiation and causing those changes in the structure. All right, let's go ahead and now kind of compare our four types of spectroscopy with our uh, different types of energies and light. So on the next page, we have a nice lovely chart that what it does is it lists all of our light types out, what movement they caused, and also kind of reminded us a little bit about what kind of spectroscopy we would use them for. Um, the main ones you would be, want to be concerned with is the UVVIS spectroscopy. Again, we're going to talk more about that next class, as well as our PES, our photoelectron spectroscopy. Um, however, what I want to call your attention to is the fact that each time that our movement increased, the energy associated with that light increased. X-ray had the most energy out of those light types. And if you notice, it caused the most internal change to happen. It caused electrons to totally leave the atom at that point, okay? However, the lowest energy thing, the microwaves, all it did was cause molecules to rotate in place. So it really didn't change much of anything. It's just twirling things around. So every time I upped that energy amount, I caused more and more change to happen. I transitioned from just rotating to vibrating to jumping electrons to all of a sudden now electrons are leaving. So I got more and more dramatic with my movement each time. So again, as the radiation energy increases, as the light type has an increase in energy, the movement that we cause would increase as well. Now, you notice that there were two types of light that we talked about on our electromagnetic spectrum that weren't mentioned in these spectroscopies. And those were radio waves and gamma waves, kind of the two uh, extreme ends of the scale when you're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. The reason for that is that radio waves are so low energy, they don't have enough energy to do anything. So that kind of takes them out of the picture there. On the opposite end of the spectrum, gamma waves have so much energy that they can actually stimulate nuclear decay to take place, where the nucleus totally breaks apart at that point. Um, and so for that kind of change, we wouldn't able to be conducting any kind of spectroscopy experiment. Um, does it cause change? Absolutely. It causes the most dramatic change of all, but we wouldn't be able to measure that change using spectroscopy equipment. All right, hopefully we're feeling good about our different types of light, as well as the different types of transitions and changes we can get when we have different types of light that we're putting into a sample of matter. Um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.